her grandmother gave it to her. This toy, the Lehman Swing Wind-Up Toy, exemplifies Ernst Paul Lehman's early German tin craftsmanship to discover the charm of nostalgic creations. Now, the company that produced it was Lehman, and it started in about 1881, and it was started by a gentleman, Ernest Lehman. This piece shows a child on a swing, suspended from a metal frame. When wound up, the swing moves back and forth, mimicking the motion of a real swing. Lehman toys were durable, whimsical, and featured clever mechanisms. The swing wind-up toy was a successful blend of artful design and playful appeal. Its nostalgic charm impressed, and the appraiser valued the item. Or could sell at auction in the three to four thousand dollar range. Really? Yes. Oh my! <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. His brother worked for U.S. Animations and asked Mike Judge for the original artwork. Mike agreed, and he took this home as gifts. The Beavis and Butthead original artwork from 1993 is a unique piece of TV history by Mike Judge, debuting in 1993. The series became a cultural icon with its unique satire and animation. This artwork includes original drawings of the characters in their signature irreverent style, a glimpse into early imagination's creative backbone. When I talked to my brother, I think he obviously understood how important it was to the to the background and to uh, the show itself. After he gave it to me, he says, I wonder if Mike Judge wants that back. <laughs> <laughs> the artwork includes sketches and layouts, capturing the essence of Beavis and Butthead. The sketch's roughness mirrors the show's lowbrow style and characters' personalities, capturing its iconic charm. The appraiser valued the item. So wow. all in all, we're looking at Three to five thousand dollars at auction. Nice. That's a nice little bonus. Absolutely. A nice <laughs> present from your brother. Yes, it is. I owe you, bro. I think it's the most expensive couch I've ever appraised, actually. I will put that in the notes. That is I <laughs> that is great. This antique Limoges chandelier was left behind by the previous owners of the cousin's parents' new home. After the sale, the previous owners regretted leaving it and asked for it back. The chandelier was gifted to our guest by her mother-in-law but it was too tall for their room. This chandelier was left by the previous owners. And after the sale was closed, I think they had regret that they had left it and asked my in-laws if they would return it to them. Upon taking it to an antique lighting specialist, they discovered it was a gas chandelier converted to electric. She took it to a business that dealt with antique um, lighting. And when they removed the piece that we needed to fit the height, they told her it was an antique Limoges chandelier. The chandelier is made of porcelain and gilded metal, but the decoration is transfer printed, not hand painted. Despite being marked as Limoges, the quality and the porcelain of the overall piece is not very strong. The appraiser noted that while Limoges is a prestigious name, the chandelier is not as valuable as expected. At auction, it would likely sell in the range of. That's I would have thought between $300 and $500 would be the correct estimate at auction. The displayed toy train has been passed down through this guest's family for generations. He was kind of an eccentric bachelor. He had given the train to my grandfather. And from my grandfather, it was passed on to my father. And we just thought we'd bring it down today and find out what it was worth. This particular train was made in 1915 by the Ives Manufacturing Company. Ives Manufacturing Company was the largest producer of toy trains in the United States from 1910 to 1924. One of the most notable features of this train is its engine, which is made from cast iron. The train also showcases beautiful greenwood surface lithography. Another interesting aspect of this train is that it comes with its original box, making it even more valuable. The train is in excellent physical condition, despite being nearly a century old. We can expect this piece of American miniature locomotive history to sell at auction for. In this condition, in this beautiful box, I would say the value on today's market would be more in the three to four thousand dollar range. So it's a real gem. A Fender Esquire guitar, once owned by a cowboy band member in the 50s and 60s, was purchased in 1954 for 300 dollars. The instrument was played for several years before being stored in a basement for about 50 years. After the father-in-law's death a few years ago, it was given to the guest's husband, who also plays guitar. With its single pickup, the Fender Esquire produces a twangy hard sound favoured by country western players. 
This model was preferred by famous musicians like Stefan Stills, David Bromberg, and Bruce Springsteen. This guitar retains its ashtray bridge cover and has an early Fender serial number, 0349. Examination revealed Phillips head screws, dating the guitar to 1952, as earlier models used straight screws. In fabulous condition and fresh to the market, the guitar's insurance value is advised at. I would conservatively rate this at about $25,000 as a bottom end that it is Tadeo Gomez. Wow. So a collector would mean a great deal. A large suitcase containing a classic Caret 2350 train was brought in, gifted by a dear friend with a vast collection of trains. While the friend was highly knowledgeable and shared much information about his collection, not all details were retained. Crafted by Georges Caret in Germany, the Caret 2350 is considered one of the finest locomotives by collectors. It rivals the esteemed Marklin trains in both quality and popularity. This model, a clockwork train that winds up, captures the quintessential look of a classic American locomotive. It includes a cow catcher, a feature added by German makers to appeal to the American market. A similar Caret 2350 sold for $17,600 just four years ago. When they wanted to make an American version, they would put a cow catcher on it. Mm -hmm. The Caret 2350 that we sold four years ago uh, brought $17,600. Despite a minor dent that could be easily repaired, this train is in comparable condition, making it approximately. The Caret 2350 that we sold four years ago uh, brought $17,600. So I think your friend was a very good friend. <laughs> A bell from the Rosebud steamer, which once traveled between St. Louis and Fort Benton, Montana, is the focal point of interest. This bell ended in Bismarck and bears inscriptions that unmistakably identify it as belonging to the Rosebud. These markings are a testament to its storied past and connection to the iconic steamer. It was made by A. Fulton Sun & Co. in Pittsburgh in 1877, a relic from the golden age of paddle steamers. The bell embodies the rich lore of the American West. It is a testament to these vessels' crucial role in river navigation and westward expansion. Crafted from cast bell metal, akin to bronze, it is noted for its durability and high quality. It's actually made of cast bell metal, which is like bronze. Okay. And uh, it's incredibly durable, incredibly well made. Purchased as an investment for $1,500 six or seven years ago, the bell is estimated to be worth between well, I would say at auction, you're probably looking around $5,000 to $7,000. Now, that's actually a pretty good investment, because how long ago did you get it? Oh, six or seven years. Well, I wish somebody would purchase it, maybe go to a museum someplace where good, it should be. Good. The guest revealed that the artwork originally hung in their father-in-law's office at the Union Pacific Railroad outlet in Sun Valley, Idaho. Notably, Sun Valley was the first destination resort for skiing in the United States. Discovered later, the artwork was identified as an original piece rather than a poster. Creighton Pete created the artwork for the Union Pacific to promote Sun Valley. It was confirmed that the artwork was a marquette for a famous poster. Given the clothing depicted, the poster was considered to be a post-World War II. Sun Valley was also famous for the movie Sun Valley Serenade, starring Sonia Henney. It was noted that the original artwork was gauche on illustration board, unlike the photolithographic printed posters. Ski poster collecting generally considers Sun Valley posters to be the most desirable of American posters. The artwork depicted a variety of events, including dog sledding, ice skating, swimming, and polka bands. The appraiser estimated its value to be around. I estimate at auction, were this to come up for sale, would be between $3,000 and $4,000. Oh my gosh. Awesome! All right! <laughs> The guests shared that the banks originally belonged to their grandfather. Interestingly, both banks were crafted by the same manufacturer. The Shepherd Hardware Ware Company, located in Buffalo, New York, was identified as the producer. During the late 19th century, mechanical banks surged in popularity as penny-saving devices. Notably, Shepherd banks did not apply a primer before putting on their finish coat. Consequently, this lack of primer made it challenging to find many Shepherd banks in good condition the Trick Pony Bank showcased significant paint loss, which was typical for Shepherd Banks. Designed by Charles Shepherd and Peter Adams around 1885, 
the Trick Pony Bank had a lengthy production run until about 1900. The second bank prominently featured an iconic image of Santa Claus. Remarkably, the Santa Claus bank had a mechanism where he dropped a penny into the chimney. This particular bank was also designed by Charles Shepard and Peter Adams, approximately in 1889. Ultimately, paint condition emerged as a crucial factor in grading mechanical banks. The appraiser estimated the price of the banks at. A nice strict pony like this, you know, the value is 800 to about $1,000. Considering the condition of this bank, I would say an auction estimate would be 3000 to 4000 Wow, really? Yeah. Oh God, he would be so pleased. <laughs> As the first public sculpture garden in the USA, Brook Green Gardens presents a vast collection of over a thousand sculptures, highlighting exceptional works by women artists today. Brook Green Gardens is a 9,100-acre sculpture garden and wildlife preserve located in Murrells Inlet, South Carolina, USA. In 1931, visionary couple Archer and Anna Hyatt Huntington transformed a former rice plantation into a breathtaking sculpture garden, Brook Green Gardens, showcasing Anna's stunning works alongside other masterpieces amidst a lush South Carolina landscape. Anne Hyatt Huntington a trailblazing sculptor and a passionate philanthropist defied convention with her bold and beautiful creations, capturing the essence of the natural world and the human experience. This is actually a smaller version of a larger piece called Red Doe and Fawn, and it was uh, sculpted in 1934. Unconventionally, Anne Hyatt Huntington mastered both large and small sculptures, a feat typically associated with male artists of her time. This breathtaking sculpture is a smaller iteration of a larger masterpiece, featuring a doe and a fawn crafted in 1934. If sold at auction today, it would command the significant price of. And what did it sell for in 1934? Probably for a few hundred dollars, three or four hundred dollars. And today, if we could find a piece similar to this in this condition? A similar piece of this would probably bring in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. In contrast, this stunning piece, known as the water lily sculpture, first modeled in 1913 would fetch a price at auction, estimated to be. So if I were to find one in condition similar to this, what would be the value of a comparable piece? A comparable piece would probably be in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range. Lastly, this charming work, also referred to as the vine, would have a significant auction worth of. What would you say the value of a piece like this would be if I had one similar to this? A similar piece would be in the twenty-five dollars to $30,000 range. Wow. This guest brought a model of Geppetto that he'd acquired at an estate sale. Geppetto is one of the famous characters of The Adventures of Pinocchio. This figure was most certainly created when Disney Studios produced the cartoon for the Pinocchio series. Obviously, it is Geppetto. In 1940, Disney Studios produced a full-length cartoon, Pinocchio. It was done after the book by uh, Carlo Collodi, and this is an animator's model from that particular movie. Disney Studios had some of the best animators of that era. At the time, Disney Studios had the best of the best in animators. You had uh, Frank Thomas, Ward Kimball, Fred Moore, Art Babbitt, who was credited with doing the animation. These types of figures are quite rare and very extreme to find. Although there are some condition issues, these types of issues are expected due to age. If you look carefully here, you can see sticking between his feet is Figaro, his cat. Just a, it's just a really wonderful, wonderful piece. Condition is nice, does have a little chipping, a little flaking, but remember, these are made out of plaster. So it's amazing that it even survived. Also, on the bottom is a mark that verifies the age of the piece, as Walt Disney production came after Walt Disney Enterprises. This piece, with its animation provenance, has a value estimate of. As far as value goes on it, I would put an estimate somewhere between $6,000 and $9,000 wow. for auction purposes. That's, That's amazing. Sure. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Before us stands an exceptionally beautiful poster, radiating elegance. In 1972, the guest stumbled upon and bought this incredible piece at a flea market in Paris. I could uh, roll them up and carry them on the plane in a tube. They were easy to transport. And on one of the trips, I saw this poster, and it was a lot smaller than the other ones I had been buying. But the dealer assured me that it was a genuine vintage poster. Lately, the guest has noticed the same image on posters being sold at low prices in stores, casting doubt on its authenticity. This charming image exudes romance, showing Cupid playfully interrupting a couple's kiss. 
with a wine offering. It's this wonderfully romantic mm -hmm. Valentine's -y image with little mm -hmm. Cupid mm -hmm. with his bow holding up a glass of port for these two archly Art Deco lovers who are they're trying to kiss and Cupid's like, no, you've got to get drunk first. It's compelling. The guests' fears are unfounded, as this is an authentic original piece produced solely in a small format, unlike the larger copies. René Vinson, a master of his craft, created this stunning work of art in the 1920s. He was a French artist and illustrator, known for his work in the Art Deco style in the 1920s and 1930s. It dates to the 1920s. Uh, it's by René Vincent, who was one of the great Art Deco poster artists of the era. He did a lot of advertisements for Peugeot wow. and for different department stores. Mm -hmm. Given current market trends, an accurate auction valuation for this captivating piece would be. This piece has sold for as much as $1,600 at mm, auction. Really? Wow. I would say in the current climate, a more realistic auction estimate would be between $800 and $1,200. Wow. Okay. So... 200-year-old family heirloom. This table is filled with rich history. The guest's ancestor, a Revolutionary War veteran, allegedly crafted this table. And it was my great-great-great-grandfather who made this for his youngest daughter in between 1810 and 1812. And her name was? Francis. Okay. Francis Vanderberg. I was the oldest son. Crafted with intricate inlay work, this piece is actually a sophisticated card table. He was appointed as a first lieutenant in the 5th Regiment of the New York Continental Army. He was 16 years old. He was born in Troy, New York. Although the guests thought the table was originally made in Indiana, its actual origin is traced to Philadelphia. The table is also likely a wedding gift and dates back to 1790. Its design features tiger-striped cherry, walnut inlays, and original brass handles. The table's proportions and leg profile are classic Philadelphia hallmarks. Its swirled wood pattern was carefully chosen by the skilled cabinet maker. This exceptional piece, one of the finest seen on the show, has an auction estimate of. I would put an auction estimate range on this table of $10,000 okay. to $20,000. Oh, good. Well, thank you. That sounds great. It should be insured for about $20,000. It's a great table. The Magnolia Mound Plantation in Baton Rouge showcases historic Campeche chairs. Appraiser Lee Kino was thrilled to find some classic examples of furniture prized in Louisiana and beyond, Campeche chairs. These chairs, named after a Mexican port, originated from the Iberian Peninsula. In addition, these types of chairs were favored by Thomas Jefferson, just like JFK favored rocking chairs. American-made versions of these Campeche chairs, especially from Louisiana, are highly sought after by collectors. And actually, they were used as far up as Virginia by people like Thomas Jefferson. A Campeche chair to Jefferson was sort of like the rocking chair was to John F. Kennedy, his favorite, favorite chair. I see. This mahogany chair, dating to around 1820, features S-shaped arms and crotch mahogany veneer. Collectors love the American-made ones, especially Louisiana chairs. And the great thing is that we really have a Louisiana chair here. It's a mahogany chair with a classic lateral cruel base. The chair's leather seat may have once been elaborately tooled. Depending on their elaborateness, Campeche chairs like this one can fetch between. The Campeche chairs range in value from 3000 to about almost $30,000 at auction. Some versions feature intricate inlays, including eagles or melon crests. A child's version, like this one, from Mexico, with simpler construction, has an estimated value of. This bring about $1,000 to $3,000. American versions bring the top end of that range. That makes sense. And those are auction values. Auction. The guest presented a captivating Art Deco diamond brooch, a cherished family heirloom passed down through generations. The piece, gifted to the guest's mother in the 1930s, had been admired for its beauty but its true value remains largely untapped. The brooch is a prime exemplar of Art Deco design. The era, renowned for its geometric forms, bold lines, and embrace of modern materials, is vividly captured in the brooch's aesthetic. The central diamond, a brilliant cut stone, commanded attention, surrounded by smaller diamonds, arranged in a dazzling sunburst pattern. The intricate setting, a harmonious blend of platinum and gold, showcased the skilled craftsmanship of the period. As a product of the 1930s, it represented a moment of artistic and cultural transformation. The Art Deco movement 
emerged as a response to the technological advancements and social changes of the era, and the brooch embodied this spirit of modernity. The brooch, at auction, would fetch nothing less than. I'm going to tell you that it's worth eight and a half thousand pounds. Oh my word! <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, crazy yes, about it. Yes, yeah. Today's show features an extraordinary tribal jewellery piece. The guest's husband discovered this remarkable piece by chance. However, efforts to locate the rightful owner through police reports and newspaper notices were unsuccessful. My husband found this jewellery when he was walking up a Forest Service road. He noticed a piece of tissue paper, a lot of it, sticking out from behind a rock. He kicked the rock over and... Lo and behold, that's what was under it. The necklace is a striking example of the Navajo people's traditional work, featuring turquoise and silver in a classic squash blossom pattern. Well, I know it's a squash blossom. I think the Navajos are the one that make it. I don't know for sure, but it's turquoise and silver. Navajo people, also known as the Diné, are a Native American tribe with a rich and storied history. Originally inhabiting the Four Corners region of the southwestern United States, they developed a unique culture, language, and spiritual practice. They are skilled farmers, herders, and artisans. And the Native Americans picked up this style from the Spanish conquistadores. Oh, really? The bracelet is composed of three medallions of turquoise. Jewelry like this was made by melting down coins and held significance for tribal use. Due to its immense popularity, in the 1960s and 70s, this jewelry was manufactured on a large scale. Although this piece dates back to the 1960s and 70s, the absence of a signature from a renowned Native American artist affects its retail value, which is... Geez, I think there was more value in the silver than that. I think 1500 would probably be a silver value. I like it anyway, so I'll just leave it in my meditation. Showcased here is a photograph given to the guest by her friend during her time in Los Angeles. In the mid-1960s, I was living at Big Sur, and I was living with this woman. Later on, I moved back down to Los Angeles, and she came to visit me, and she gave me the photograph. The photograph, taken around 1930 by William Mortensen, captures his signature style. Mortensen was an American glamour photographer, best known for his Hollywood portraits. And he was something of a very colourful figure in the photography world. He started his career in Hollywood in the 1920s. The photographer's signature is visible in the upper right corner of the photograph. Mortensen often worked with multiple negatives, a technique clearly evident in this image. You had been researching Mortensen and found out a little bit about his relationship to some other photographers. Every detail of this photograph is highly refined, a result of the very small aperture used in capturing it. There is slight discoloration in the lower area, which could somewhat affect its value. In today's market, despite its condition, this photograph by Mortensen is estimated to be worth. At auction, I would estimate a photograph in this size of this format in the $2,000 to $3,000 range. The guest brought in a silver chocolate pot, a family heirloom passed down through generations. The pot had been mistakenly identified as a chocolate pot in the past, a common misconception given its shape. Through careful examination, it is revealed that the pot's true identity is a product of the renowned Newcastle silversmith, George Borman, dating back to 1737. The hallmark, featuring the Three Castles emblem, confirmed its English origin and the date of manufacture. Despite its historical significance, the pot's value was somewhat diminished by the addition of decorative chasing, a technique employed to embellish the silver. This alteration, likely performed in the Victorian era, detracted from the pot's original aesthetic and reduced its desirability among collectors seeking authentic antique pieces. The discovery transformed a seemingly ordinary household item into a valuable antique. Despite the modifications, the appraiser estimated the pot's value at a substantial but even so, I mean, a piece like that today, you're probably looking at around about uh, 1,500, 2,000 pounds. The guest shared a remarkable story of a pair of claret jugs, cherished family heirlooms passed down through generations. The jugs, purchased by the guest's husband in the 1960s for a modest sum, had been admired for their beauty, but their true value remained unknown. It is revealed that the jugs are exceptional examples of Georgian silver craftsmanship. The maker, Paul Storr, 
was renowned as one of the greatest silversmiths of his era. The date of manufacture, 1838, placed the jugs within a period of peak artistry and craftsmanship. The jugs are in exceptional condition, with the intricate vine detailing and vibrant silver remaining intact. The delicate balance between form and function, characteristic of Georgian design, was evident in the jug's elegant silhouette and practical purpose. The pair of jugs was valued at. Of somewhere around 30,000 plus. What? Wow! That's fabulous! The guest presented a captivating painting, a family heirloom passed down through generations. The artwork, depicting a charming scene of goslings and their mother, had been admired for its beauty and craftsmanship. It is revealed that the painting is a work by Samuel John Carter, a renowned British animal painter of the 19th century. Carter, known for his meticulous attention to detail and his ability to capture the essence of his subjects, was a celebrated figure in the art world. The painting in question, with its vibrant colours, delicate brushstrokes and lifelike portrayal of the animals, exemplified Carter's artistic mastery. The painting is in excellent condition, despite its age, but would need professional cleaning and conservation to preserve its longevity. The discovery of Carter's signature on the painting added further weight to its authenticity and significantly increased its value. The estimated value of the painting is at a substantial. In a sale, three to four thousand pounds. Should insure it, five thousand pounds. They were charming thing. Thank you for bringing it. Thank you. <laughs> The guest brought a number of items onto the show that were given to him by his wife's family. His wife is a descendant of Stephen Decatur, to whom these items are related. Decatur was a United States Navy officer who supervised the construction of several U.S. Navy vessels. What we have here are his midshipman's warrant that he obtained in 1798, his lieutenant's commission from 1799. These items include Decatur's midshipman's warrant from 1798, his lieutenant's commission from 1799, and his commission as captain, obtained in 1804. Decatur is remembered for his contributions to the United States Navy. It's unusual in this time period to find this material because there simply were not that many commissioned naval officers. Particularly for helping capture a catch rigged Tripolitan vessel. So as a lieutenant, that's when things got very interesting for Stephen Decatur. Stephen Decatur's men were very loyal to him. President Jefferson promoted Decatur to captain for his heroic actions during the battle at Tripoli. Thomas Jefferson was an American statesman, planter, diplomat, lawyer, architect, philosopher, and founding father, who served as the third president of the United States from 1801 to 1809. These documents are significant to American history and would easily command a high price. I would be very comfortable placing an insurance value on these in the range of $150,000 to $200,000. Wow. A hushed reverence fills the air as the camera pans across a living room wall. Three artworks seemingly casually displayed command attention. A Picasso etching, its lines etched with the master's distinctive flair, hangs beside a vibrant Matisse lithograph, a symphony of colour and form. Between a Rodin bronze sculpture, its textured surface hinting at the depth of emotion captured within, completes the unexpected ensemble. And obviously because somebody else was printed from the plate, they weren't allowed to sign it with Picasso's signature, only he was doing that. So that's your Picasso etching, it's a, it's a portrait of his good friend, probably printed around the late 1960s, early 1970s. Unbeknownst to the homeowner, these pieces represent a treasure trove of artistic brilliance. A portrait of Picasso brimming with character is revealed to be a later painting, yet it still holds a substantial value. A quintessential example of the artist's mature style, Matisse showcases his ability to convey profound emotion through simplified forms. At auction, the revelation of their combined worth is a staggering all combined, oh, you, have, you have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $70,000 for uh, replacement value. I did not expect that. They're, they're lovely images, and I don't think you could have three more evocative images for each artist. Yeah, I never would have thought of that. About 20 years ago, the guest purchased the showcase flag from a resale shop in Chicago. 
About 15 or 20 years ago, I was at one of my favorite resale shops in Chicago, Salvation Army. It is a printed American flag with 36 stars, stripes, and a blue canton, all on cotton fabric. Each star on this flag represents the states that existed at the time it was made, in 1886. This particular flag is a temporary show flag, intended for use in parades. The last time 36 stars appeared on the United States flag was July 3rd, 1867. Therefore, this flag was only in use for about two years, making it a rare piece. It's the sort of piece that typically were used in parades, really just sort of a temporary show flag. Nevada was the 36th state. This flag still retains its color and is in excellent condition. At auction, given the historical significance of this flag to America and its current condition, it would be worth. Auction situation, I would estimate this with a value of approximately three to five thousand dollars. Wow. And I think it has the potential to, to sell nearer the higher end of that range. Not bad for thirteen dollars. <laughs> Noel Barrett is a passionate toy collector, residing in eastern Pennsylvania. He possesses a truly extraordinary piece, a larger-than-life Speedy the Alka-Seltzer mascot. This iconic advertising figure, a towering representation of the effervescent pain reliever, has a remarkable backstory. Discovered in a pile of discarded items in a bakery attic in 1969, Barrett rescued the colossal mascot from an uncertain fate. What you have here is an absolutely wonderful advertising figure. I understand you've done a little bit of research trying to figure out the value. The only Alka-Seltzer figures I saw were about six inches high. Uh -huh. Speedy, a product of the mid-20th century advertising boom, is a rare find due to its immense size. While smaller Alka-Seltzer figurines are relatively common and valued in the hundreds of dollars. Despite the fluctuation in estimated worth, Barrett's affection for his unusual companion remains steadfast. This speedy mascot serves as a tangible link to a bygone era of advertising and a cherished piece of Barrett's eclectic collection. At auction, this phenomenal item appraised at a staggering. And I think today, if I had this at auction, I would probably estimate it at like two to three thousand. A little bit less than I paid for it, but I don't care. I love it. This quilt belonged to the guest's great, great, great uncle, Charles, who was a sea captain who sailed primarily out of Portland, Maine. It bore a name called Masseuse, and like other quilts, they have the same motifs and designs. But this quilt is special, as it has a specific nautical theme to it. The quilt conjures up what was important in the career of the owner, which was being the captain of the vessel out of Portland, Maine. The quilt design showed they were charting a course, as there is a binnacle and the Norwegian Union flag, which probably indicated the name of the vessel. Also, the quilt has a speaking horn used by a deckhand, a barometer, a lighthouse, and a sextant. Due to its rarity, this sort of quilt would be appealing to those who love quilts and those who love maritime antiques. About the condition of this quilt, most areas are bright and red, but the blue fabric has washed. Hence, because of the rarity and beauty, an insurance value between $20,000 to $25,000, but at auction, a reasonable estimate would be. I would estimate it at least at auction at probably twelve to $18,000. During the 80s, when this guest was in the National Guard in Danbury, Connecticut, he picked this item from the basement of a civil air defense shelter. The inscription on the signpost, WCTU, is an acronym for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was founded around 1873 and is still in existence. They were very big proponents of anti-slavery, prohibition, and also women's suffrage. This is an anti-alcohol sign that was probably made around 1919 when the Prohibition Act was passed into law. Moreover, this sign is porcelain on metal and would have been put up beside the road for all to see. Although there are a lot of reproductions of this sign, this is the original sign, as the holes and grommets are correctly placed. The actual date would be around 1910 to 1915, and the backside really showed this sign is like the piece de resistance because of the skull and crossbones. It is a great display piece and collectible, which would be estimated at an auction for. The value, if I were to put this at auction, I would put a $3,000 to $5,000 estimate on it. Really? And I think it would sell in every bit of that. And if you get the right people bidding on it who yeah. love this type of uh, right. imagery, mm -hmm. it'll go for more. A seemingly unremarkable piece of ceramic art purchased for a modest sum at a Chicago estate sale holds a surprising secret. 
Its ornate design initially suggested a European origin, but a closer examination by an antiques appraiser revealed a different story. Its weight, texture, and overall aesthetic of this piece pointed towards an American rather than a European provenance, a type of glazed ceramic commonly used in decorative elements on buildings. Chicago, renowned for its architectural innovations at the turn of the 20th century, was a major center for faience production. Two primary companies dominated the market, Tico and Northwest Terracotta. Based on the piece's distinctive style, characterized by a soft texture, exaggerated floral motifs, and a bulky form, the appraiser confidently attributed it to Northwest Terracotta, an estimated auction value soaring a range of. I think at auction, it's between $4,000 and $6,000. I really wow. do. And if we can prove it's Northwest Terracotta, it goes up from there. A cherished family heirloom, an attractive sampler brought to the show. Basically, it was crafted by a young Mary Jane in 1852. This phenomenal artwork comes from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. It is a quintessential example of 19th century folk art. Its vibrant colors and substantial size immediately caught the appraiser's attention. The intricate stitches and detailed motifs display a level of skill and patience uncommon for a 13-year-old girl. Recognizing the sample as historical and artistic merit, the appraiser assessed its potential market value. Given its age, condition, and aesthetic appeal, the sampler was estimated to fetch between. This is probably worth in the range, an auction of 3000 to 5000 Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> A colossal, multifunctional piece of ironwork, affectionately dubbed the monstrosity by its owners, crafted by the skill of an anonymous ironworker, likely the guest's great-grandfather. It was built by my father's maternal grandfather. He was an ironworker, and I guess this is what he did in his spare time. We got it about 25 years ago. This extraordinary creation is a testament to 19th century American ingenuity. This intricate assemblage boasts a clock tower, dual bird cages, an aquarium, an elevator, and a hidden gasolier. Complexity and scale of this piece suggest a labor of love, created during a time when mechanical artistry was widely appreciated, while its precise function remains somewhat enigmatic. So, the integration of various elements hints at a desire to create a self-contained ecosystem, with the aquarium potentially powered by a steam engine. Despite its grandeur, the piece's value remains somewhat elusive. The steam engine, and this was, our thought is to power the aquarium, to aerate the aquarium. Its unique nature and historical significance make it a challenging item to appraise. However, experts estimate its auction value at between. With an auction estimate of three to 5,000. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons we're keeping it down a little bit is simply because it would take a lot to get this. A charming antique box, a cherished possession acquired by a couple during their early years of marriage. Discovered on an antiquing excursion to Vermont in the early 1970s, the box captivated the owner with its rustic appeal. Expert appraisal revealed the box to be a quintessential example of New England craftsmanship dating back to the 1830s or 1840s. Its exceptional state of preservation, characterized by vibrant original paint and intact decorative elements, is a rarity in the antiques market. This incredible box has a flat lid, a unique feature compared to the more commonly found dome tops. It enhances its desirability among collectors seeking to create visually appealing snack displays. What was once a beloved decorative piece has emerged as a valuable antique. The box's auction value is estimated at between. Well, I would say today at auction it would easily bring between $2,000 and $4,000. Wow, well maybe my kids will like it better now. This tile, a cherished gift to the guest's grandfather, carries both familial and artistic significance. Likely crafted between 1918 and 1925, this piece exemplifies the rich tradition of American ceramic art during that era. Its vibrant colors and intricate details suggest the work of Karl Müller, a renowned ceramic artist who emigrated from Germany to the United States. Karl Müller is known for his keen eye for design and his ability to blend European craftsmanship with American sensibilities. His pieces are highly regarded for their artistic appeal and craftsmanship, making them sought-after items in the art and antique market. Though Müller was primarily known for his work with tiles, he also created a variety of other ceramic pieces, including vases and plaques. 
This tile is a prime example of Mueller's work with its striking color palette and detailed imagery. In terms of valuation, the tile's aesthetic and historical value would place it at. It would easily be $1,500 to $2,000 at auction. If it is Mueller, $2,000 to $3,000 and possibly more. That's wonderful. A collection of peculiar figurines passed down through generations awaited appraisal. Family law attributed them to German soldiers, their origin a mystery. Upon unveiling the figurines, the appraiser was visibly astonished. My father said that they're German soldiers, and we didn't ask that many questions back then. We don't know how the family got them, whether they came over with the original member of our family from Germany back in 1850s. Never before had such an intricate lifelike piece crossed their path. These nodding figures, or nodders, were unlike any seen in their decades of experience. Crafted from a base metal alloy, they showcased remarkable details in both casting and hand-painted decoration. This level of artistry suggested a cottage industry production, with artisans meticulously bringing these small figurines to life, dating these pieces to the early 20th century. Circa 1900 to 1910, the appraiser noted their playful nature yet undeniable craftsmanship. While their historical and artistic value was evident, determining a precise monetary worth proved challenging due to their rarity. However, given their appeal to collectors of automotive toys, trains and nodders, an estimated retail value of. Retail setting, we figured it at least about $250 a piece. Wow. <laughs> so you have $1,500 here. A striking piece of wall art, acquired by the guests' parents in the early 1960s, stood as a testament to their discerning taste. Initially purchased as both an art object and functional furniture, the piece had hung unadorned on a New York City apartment wall for years. It is identified as a work of credenza, or sideboard, uniquely designed and fabricated by the renowned artist and craftsman Paul Evans. This is a credenza, or a, a buffet, or a sideboard. It's meant to hang against a wall, and it was designed and fabricated by Paul Evans. Although he made furniture, I think this is, if it's anything, it's a piece of sculpture. Rather than a mere piece of furniture, the appraiser classified it as a sculptural work of art. Its vibrant colors and deep relief designs were hallmarks of Evans' style, Educated at prestigious American craft schools, including the renowned Cranbrook Academy of Art. Ironically, the guest's parents, likely unaware of this connection, had acquired a piece by this influential artist. A closer inspection revealed the piece was signed and dated 1968, confirming its authenticity. Created in Evans' New Hope, Pennsylvania workshops, the piece was part of a limited production. It showcases the artist's penchant for incorporating raw materials and industrial elements into his work. At auction, the appraiser estimated the piece's auction value at a substantial. Well, we would put an auction estimate on this in the twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollar range. Uh -huh. So it is a a, a pretty, uh, you know, wonderful, hefty uh -huh. a price. And I'm guessing your parents didn't pay anywhere near that. This guest presented a remarkable collection of Native American artifacts passed down from their great grandfather a government storekeeper among the tribes of Nebraska from 1871 to 1873. These objects, imbued with history and cultural significance, offered a glimpse into the lives of the Plains peoples. Firstly, a large parflesh trunk, a type typically used for clothing storage, made from buffalo rawhide and adorned with traditional paints. It was estimated to date back to the 1830s or 40s, a testament to the craftsmanship of its makers. Next came a possible bag, used for various storage needs within a teepee or earth lodge. This particular piece, crafted from buffalo hide and decorated with meticulously dated beads, provided a window into 1840s plains artistry. This is made out of buffalo hide, and because of all these three size beads, we can date this right to about the 1840s. Wow. A powerful elk antler quirt, used for both horse control and defense, showcased the ingenuity of its creators. An intricate trade cloth strap and buffalo hide lash added a touch of artistry to this utilitarian tool. The final item, an elk horn scraper, held a deeper meaning. Beyond its practical function of hide cleaning, the etched dots pointed to a tally of hides processed, a fascinating record of women's labor. It also displayed military figures, hinting at the tribes with whom the guest's great-grandfather likely interacted. The Pawnee, Iowa, or Sac Fox, 
each piece received a staggering individual valuation, ranging from Wonderful. these four pieces, I would conservatively say 130 to 200 thousand dollars. Well. They're, they're real treasures. They and, are absolutely and treasures. And I'm, I'm so pleased that we have retained them and they can be passed down through the generations. A porcelain vase inherited from the guest's mother held a surprising story. Acquired during a visit to England in 1970, the vase had been a spontaneous gift from a friend's mother. Little attention was paid to the piece until years later when a Curiosity online search yielded inconclusive results. It is recognized as a remarkable example of Rosenberg Porcelain, a renowned Dutch ceramics company. Emerging in the late 19th century, Rosenberg departed from the traditional blue and white Delftware in favor of Art Nouveau styles. With its ethereal eggshell porcelain and exquisite Asian-inspired motifs, this intricate piece embodies the epitome of this aesthetic. It was part of a specific line produced between the 1890s and 1913, a period when Rosenberg achieved international acclaim at auction, this phenomenal vase could fetch a value between. At auction, I would estimate this at two to three thousand dollars. Mm. Surprised. This guest presented a pair of understated yet elegant cufflinks, acquired casually from a friend a decade prior. Unbeknownst to the owner, these cufflinks represented a pinnacle of Art Deco jewelry design. Their unique mechanism, patented in France was a testament to Cartier's innovative spirit during the Art Deco era. Expert craftsmanship extended beyond the functional aspect. These cufflinks were adorned with precious materials, platinum, diamonds, and sapphires, exhibiting the jeweler's mastery. Cartier's signature, along with the distinct French hallmarks and serial number, authenticated the piece as an early example of the brand's work. The appraiser emphasized the rarity of such early Cartier cufflinks, noting the countless innovations that followed. At auction, the guest's initial purchase price of $500 paled in comparison to the appraiser's estimate of. In the market today, at auction, I would estimate them five to 7,000. That's great. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> this is a silver punch bowl by the Hallett family, one of the very prominent early families when Colorado first became a state prior to the turn of the century. It was owned by the Hallett family, which was one of the very prominent early families when Colorado first became a state, just prior to the turn of the century. On this punch bowl is an inscription that says Mr. and Mrs. Hallett, presented by the employees of the Smuggler Mining Company, May 1st, 1901. What's interesting is the very typical Art Nouveau decor from that period, which this bowl features. This punch bowl has poppies, scrolling foliage, and a gilt finish on the inside. Inside we have a gilt finish that would have protected the silver from any corrosive substances. Although where this punch bowl was made remains a mystery, we know the maker is Gorham Manufacturing Company. Presumably the silver used to make this bowl was from the smuggler's mine in Colorado. At auction today, this silver punch bowl with a gilt finish and scrolling foliage would have a price of. An auction, this would bring about $4,000 to $5,000. Really? Yes. That's, that's surprising. We are presented with a little treasure basket that the guest bought in. I bought it in Northern California around the Eureka area. Okay. And I believe it was used for little trinkets maybe. North Carolina. This amazing little treasure basket was made by Elizabeth Hickox. She was a weot master and considered one of the finest basket weavers of her time. It's quite an amazing little piece. This basket was made by one of the greatest basket makers in North America, a lady named Elizabeth Hickox. Typical of a basket woven by Elizabeth is the zigzag pattern seen on this treasure basket. It's also seen to be extremely finely woven and geometric in shape. One fascinating thing about the yellow on the basket is that it's a porcupine's quill. The zigzags were always geometric, do you know what the yellow is? I have no idea. Believe it or not, it's porcupine quill. The little knob on the top of the basket is characteristic of her work and her distinctive mark. This basket with a porcupine quill finely woven into the fabric on a retail basis would sell for. This basket on a retail basis would sell for about $5,500. Exhibited on the show is a print acquired by the guest's husband at a garage sale about 40 years ago. 
This print, my husband got it at a garage sale about 40 years ago, and it was never my favorite thing. This particular print, made in 1884 by the Courier and Ives Company in New York, is notable for its historical significance. Courier and Ives was a New York-based printmaking firm, renowned for its popular lithographs depicting various aspects of American life. The piece is titled A Four-Oared Shell Race and features two boats with four men racing down a river. The lithograph was printed in black and white with the colors applied by hand using watercolors. Another notable element in the scene is a steamboat filled with spectators watching the race. The print is very clean and has been well preserved over the years. Given the legacy of Courier and Ives, this piece would easily be worth. A print like this should sell for about $3,500. Our guest today brought onto the show a jug and pot made by a member of their extended family, Linnea Meaders. Meaders was a potter renowned for his face jugs, for which he was regarded as a master of the form. These displayed items were made very early in the potter's career, Cersa 1950s. Underneath both of these items, we can see the maker's signature, further authenticating each piece. Typical of Meader's work, this jug is a face jug with grotesque features. It was made to store liquids such as vinegar, lamp oil, moonshine, and so on. Given the popularity of Meader's work, this face jug would be worth. But they'll go anywhere from uh, one to five thousand dollars. I figure this one right here is probably worth about twenty-five hundred dollars. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> This pot, on the other hand, was made for decorative purposes and is adorned with molded decorations. At auction, we can expect this beautiful piece of pottery to command a price of. These molded pieces like this have been bringing anywhere from $1,200 to $2,800.